Who's searching for your button to turn your mic? Alex, we have you shut off already. Uh, you guys are all on mute, so I can't hear anything in the room, uh -oh. just FYI. Well, we can hear you, Alex. <laughs> so I don't know if you're asking me a question. Sorry. So I will hold you there. So, Mark, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, Mark Farah, developer representative. I can hear you great. Okay. And Alex, can you hear us? No, Alex cannot hear us. Okay, thank you. Alex, we'll, get, we'll work on that. Can you chat with them or something? Okay, we can go ahead and go start with a brand new person. Introduce yourself. And yeah, uh, Josh Johnson, Newmar Services, Prima Plant Services. Uh, Mike Yara, Prima Services, also with Prima Plant Services. Rick Shanway, I'm in the strategy group for engineering and technology, and I'm also the interim under Bank Chris White, Newmar Services, Culture Equity Awareness. Logan Alms, Chief Utility Operations. I believe you are Steve Joe Hall, Chief Utility Relations. Brian Fogg, Washington County Office of Community Development. I'm a housing rehab specialist. Can you report from the engagement manager? PW. Mel Peterson, CWS, Better Youth Project. Mel Waterline, the Modern Service and Development Services. Steve Dickinson, Nelson Program Manager with the Office of Community Development at Washington County. Larry Leonard, Kilar Services, General Counsel. Now, should do this operations officer. Andy Broad, Services, something's planned, everybody. And now I'm going to go back to you, Alex, so you can introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. Alex Fan, District 1 rep. Thank, thank you very much. And Stephanie Morris, Company Water Services. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it back to you, Jeff. Okay. I will acknowledge that we accept the you and accept the summary of the April meeting. And we'll introduce our first item to the on site septic financial aid program. Vanel and Daniel. I will also be presenting with uh, Brian and Jan today. Our purpose here is to provide input. Engagement and the outreach plan. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so uh, we're here to talk to you about um, DQ's on site project financial aid program and a grant that we re recently received from them. So I'm going to go over DQ's program and kind of uh, what that was about. And then we partnered with Washington County, and they're going to talk about the implementation and a little bit about their program. And then Daniel's going to wrap us up with our community engagement for the program. So DQ has um, a program that their goal is to um, get grants and financial aid to homeowners or people with septic systems to help protect human health and community. So during um, COVID, they received 15 million from the Oregon State Legislature. And they first, they had two rounds that they released this funding in. First round was targeted at the 2020 and 2021 wildfires. And that was to help folks um, who had experienced wildfires um, rebuilt. And a lot of times, sometimes insurance when your home builds down or burns down, the insurance doesn't cover the septic replacement, but you can't get the permit to rebuild your home if you don't have the septic system. So that's where DQ really wanted to focus um, the first round. So um, they got that money out and then they rolled the second round in, in the fall of, of 2022. I found out about it because we oftentimes have applicants come in and they learn that they're within 300 feet of the public system and they're like, you got to connect. And then they learn how expensive that is. And it's, it's a real hard for people. 
So we started snooping around, seeing what was available to see if we could potentially help folks out with grants, and we found this one. So uh, this grant uh, can cover um, maintenance and repair of a septic system. It can cover the decommissioning of a septic system. It can cover the connection to the public line. So all of the private um, plumbing and utility of a, a sanitary septic, it can cover. It cannot cover very explicitly not cover public extension. So this is just specifically to um, the homeowner and their private private plumbing. So um, we put together a, uh, a grant proposal and we were only able to do this because Shannon said yes. And she said <laughs> yes about a week and a half before the grant was due. Uh, so we were really flying by the seat of our pants, um, but we found their um, housing and rehabilitation program and it really had the infrastructure to implement this program. So. We had cafe leaders that's like, yes, we know how to implement our grant funding. We can do this financially. And so it just became a really great partnership where Clean Water Services was going to be good at the financial side. Washington County, through um, Shannon and Brian's program, was going to be at the implementation side. So we put this grant together. Um, we, it, when you put the grant together, they asked you to evaluate the need in your jurisdiction. We did a, a GIS analysis and the parameters. Oh, maybe I'll show that in a second. We we used the GIS analysis to do that, and we originally thought we uh, or the total need would have been around two million for for unsewered tax lots in our in our uh, district. Um, and DQ looked at our package and they awarded us one million. So one million of the five point two was we we thought we did. Um, so anyway, I mentioned the GIS analysis, and so what we did, this is uh, what we originally based our uh, financial need on and proposed to DQ. So what we did is we took um, the lime green, our census blocks, and those are census blocks for 50% of the tax lots meet low to moderate income. And then the little blue um, rectangles, or they kind of look like dots from here, those are tax lots that are within 50 feet of a public uh, system or the public line. So really, those could be really good candidates. And then uh, there's kind of another green out there, and that's between 50 and 300, so still within that regulatory 300 feet. And then the pink ones would be outside of the 300 um, feet to a public line. Those folks, we still plan on doing outreach to Daniel cover that, but um, we could still assist those folks with um, repairs um, or replacement. But the folks that are closer to the line, our goal is to get them connected to those. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Sharon. Sure. Right, well, thanks so much for the opportunity to be with you this evening. Um, I said earlier, my name is Shannon Wilson, so I'm the program manager for our Office of Community Development at the county. Uh, so there you see on the slide our mission. Um, and just to clarify, too, if you're familiar with the county government structure, so there are a lot of large departments of the county, uh, and then there are also offices like ours. So we are a distinct uh, area of the county, like we're separate from health, health and human services and separate from housing, uh, but we are a small team. So we have 11 staff total. So um, we always like to say small, small and mighty. That's what everyone else small team likes to say, small but mighty. Um, and so we primarily uh, work in the community to support organizations a lot with federal funding that we administer. So uh, community development block grant programs and home programs that really support important services, infrastructure, and facilities uh, for low and moderate income people. Either they're serving those households directly or their projects that are in areas that are primarily uh, low or moderate income. Uh, so some of our specific programs are there, there on the slide as well. The one we're here to talk about tonight is our housing rehabilitation program. Uh, that is the one program that we, um, their staff actually do directly. So Brian, and then we have another staff person in our office, Sarah, uh, that do the housing rehab program uh, directly. So they're out there working with clients, working one-on-one -on -one with low-income home homeowners and working to identify needs that they have in their housing to replace. Uh, and, and we identify the different programs that they may be eligible for to do those important repairs. So we have a wood stove exchange program. 
Uh, that also impacts the outdoor air quality, so it has a community benefit as well as a personal benefit for that household that has improved indoor air quality. Then we have housing for the disabled and elderly program, uh, the Hardy program. Uh, and then our favorite one to say the Dibble program, which is the Deferred Interest Bearing Loan Program. So that's a very low interest loan that uh, that a household can have on their property to pay for important repairs, and then it's only due when they sell the home. Um, so that is an important program as well. And then Brian uh, navigates the and coordinates the City of Hillsboro Housing Rehabilitation Program. So a lot of our federal funding is broken up where we can only serve you know, households in certain jurisdictions, and so the City of Hillsboro is a um, specific fund uh, just for that city based on that federal allocation. Uh, and so this, the uh, septic assistance program really fits in with the work we're already been doing in the housing rehabilitation program. That's why it was such a great fit when Danelle uh, called and, and contacted us. So, uh, so we were really excited to be a part of this project and really see it as a natural fit. Um, so we've been administering this housing rehabilitation program since the office was founded in 1978. Uh, and as I was mentioning earlier, the program really focuses on improving the life, health, and safety and accessibility for these dwellers. Um, and one thing, so I began in my role uh, last fall. Previous to that, I worked for the housing authority for the county. Um, and so I know, know about housing, but um, one of the things that's really interesting to me coming to this program, specifically with the housing rehab, is to see the connection between homelessness and home ownership. A lot of these homeowners, um, you know, their home has been owned it free and clear for many years, now they're living on a fixed income. And so if they couldn't, uh, if they're not able to maintain their home, then otherwise they couldn't afford rent in, uh, in our local market. And so just really seeing the value and that important connection, um, definitely to maintain our housing stock within the county, uh, but also just I wasn't aware of that connection between homelessness and home ownership in that way before. Um, so I think in the same way, the septic program is a really, uh, it can have that same similar impact where someone has been living for a long time with the septic system uh, and doesn't have the resources uh, to, to maintain it or to connect to the stair line. They also don't have the resources to move. So um, just wanted to highlight that, uh, the need and value of the program is coming. Uh, and then just some kind of, a couple of statistics there for you on the slides. We've completed almost 1,400 rehabilitation projects uh, in that 45-year that history uh, and have committed $6 million overall to housing rehab activities, primarily from federal funds that are allocated to the county. Uh, we complete roughly 30 to 40 projects a year with our, our two staff that we have dedicated to this program. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to Brian to talk more about the, some of the logistics of the program. Thank you. Okay, so with the new online site septic assistance program, we'll be targeting households below 80%. Uh, they can qualify for up to $25,000 to connect to an existing sewer line, repair or replace an existing septic tank. Families above 80% of the median family area income uh, would still qualify for a smaller grant, but only to connect to an existing sewer line. It would be a $5,000 grant. Um, we will provide a list of approved contractors to every uh, eligible applicant um, to give them the opportunity to, to select their own contractor. Of course, if the homeowner would rather I help them assist them with that selection and, uh, you know, walk them through the whole uh, construction process, I'm happy to do that as well as that's what I do in my normal day job. Um, projects will be prioritized to low moderate income households, um, areas where we can make a larger impact where multiple households can be connected to the sewer or where current septic systems kind of constitute an environmental hazard. There's an active leak or something like that. Those will be our priority projects. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and pass over to Daniel, who will talk about how we're doing our outreach. Anybody else had to do that? <laughs> um, so thank you for having us. Thanks, Brian, uh, for allowing us the time to present today uh, on this great program, as well as the engagement piece uh, that we have here today. Uh, we worked really closely to come up with a message for the plan where we collectively work internally and externally to make the 
material is really easily understandable. Um, this could be potentially a complicated thing if we're going out to the public. So we worked really hard to make sure that that message was easily understandable before we even went to start designing anything. Um, the strategy's purpose is to raise awareness of the program uh, to the residents within Clean Water Services service area in Washington County. Uh, we plan to prioritize our engagement to low income uh, residents, like Brian said, uh, but really to the people that need this assistance the most. That's the key piece of this program. Uh, some of our stakeholders, as you can see, are the qualifying residents themselves, uh, homeowners associations that could help us get the word out, uh, as well as the septic systems contractors that may know some specific folks that may need this, this uh, program them as well. Uh, Clean Water Services uh, Partner Cities is a, another way to communicate this program out. And, and the Home Building Association, which is also tied to the, the contractor side. Those are our stakeholders in this. Uh, we plan to use tools such as direct mail, social media, uh, the CPOs out of Washington County as well, um, for the community participation organizations, just in case. Um, community engagement liaisons uh, as well. That's something we're really talking to try to get really dive into the communities that, that we're targeting, um, specifically to the low mod and, and uh, potentially underserved communities. So that's something that that organization is really, we're talking to them currently, um, as well as the culturally specific organizations in the county, uh, working with them as well to try to make sure that we reach the right people. Uh, we have our materials translated into Spanish currently, but uh, Washington County also has uh, 20 additional languages uh, service to do that as well. So we only have it in Spanish as what we're sending out because that's the primary language that we've identified, but we also have that service in our back pocket. So this map looks very similar to the one Danielle uh, presented earlier, but this one has a, an overlay that includes uh, demographics. Um, we, we, we added demographics to the census tract economic data. Um, it was important for us to evaluate through an equity lens when we were putting this outreach uh, plan together. Uh, there, we really did it to see if there was an overlay or, or an overlap uh, of low income residents uh, with underserved communities. Uh, we use this to guide our outreach plan and to be intentional about reaching the right people. Uh, the map shows here, as you can see, it's a, I was calling it light green earlier, but then now I think it's got it right. I think it's lime green. Um, lime green and dark green uh, overlapping, showing that there are concentrations uh, of non-white residents within the low income uh, data. Uh, so what we did is we, we planned to, uh, to send out our first wave of outreach uh, to our priority audience in the sections that are low moderate uh, this includes those concentrations that I, I spoke about that overlap. We, we were looking at how to best do that and make sure we, we reach the right audiences. And originally we were going to have separate mailings and ultimately we decided that because there is that overlap by doing it to low moderate, then it captures that concentration. So we, that's why we did this map to just to make sure that we were capturing the, the people we were looking for. Um, when we say priority, by sending a first wave to this specific target audience, this is gonna give them 60 days um, runway to be able to uh, apply for the program. That gives them time to ask questions, uh, if, if they need to, uh, to do, uh, to understand the program, as well as if they see, need to seek guidance. So if there's any, any of those things out there, it gives them a little bit, little bit more, a little extra time um, a lot of times there might be language barriers, so that that's the kind of stuff we're we're trying to accomplish there. The secondary audience is the rest of remaining residents in in the service area. Uh, the data is really guiding us to make sure that our efforts are intentional to reach the right people and the people that need it the most for the purpose of the program. Um, the second, we'll be using the the tools that we talked about earlier as far as social media and, and reaching out with culturally sensitive uh, organizations to do that outreach. Next slide, please. And this is the last slide, which shows you the program schedule. Uh, we plan on, uh, on doing public outreach uh, as of June 2023 through uh, March of next year. 
uh, this is we've uh, we, we're ready to roll as far as getting that outreach started. Uh, but we've given ourselves a little bit of leeway to take uh, any of your input tonight. Uh, so we're, we're ready to go, but we're we're also giving ourselves a little bit of time in, in case there's some input that we want to incorporate. Um, we're going to be evaluating and providing assistance um, again through June. Uh, it seems a little strange that we're having June there for evaluations, but um, the, the actual application was live uh, early in June because of the guidelines that the, the grant had. So we have that. We haven't promoted anything. It's just sitting there, but people find out and we, we acknowledge that. So by that, we've already uh, received uh, some applications. Um, so that's, that's why that's on there the way you see it. Um, the projects need to be scoped, bid, and obligated uh, by June 30 of next year. And all funds must be spent by December 31st of 2026. So that concludes our presentation tonight. But uh, looking forward to hearing some input. Uh, if you have any questions on on the presentation overall, but primarily on the engagement and outreach piece, if there's any guidance you could provide, I'll take it. Yes, ma'am. So looking at the amount of funding that's available, I have no idea what it costs to connect to sewer. Is 25,000 enough to do that for most of these people? Yeah, so that's just an estimate that we, Andy Brown here actually helped us come up with. That's it. We, we surveyed a few contractors that were familiar with and um, just kind of got a middle number. Um, some, depending on the topography and, you know, the, if there's utility complex or just helping the property in, the, the line of ground they need, um, those are all factors that could make it that $25,000 number. We also have a provision in the grant. So, say, Digging along and there's utility conflict, or we come across like some culturally important resources that there needs to stop. There's um, some additional funding that they can that we can give if if it's in fact even more expensive. Hoping not every project is that expensive. We're hoping that we can get some cheaper fixes, but that was just kind of a, an average that we came across that we felt comfortable using. Or the, the estimates that we gave the DQ for a cost per project. Um, and then you have to come up with some sort of financial structure. So we, we felt fairly confident with that. Look, Andy, I'm just stand over. Do you have any questions? No, I think that you, that one. Well. Right. I've done this a lot. Um, how many bids do you get on each job? Yeah, I presume you have a preferred list of the excavators to do this. How many bids? So, in terms of the contractors, we'll be providing the homeowner with a list so they can select their own. I'm going to ask them to get three bids and then make their determination about who they wish to hire for the project. Um, and when I do the project, <coughs> the process with at least three bids. And you give them the, you, you have a preferred list of vendors. That We're know. creating that. Item. Yes. Um, right now on the county purchasing site, we are soliciting for contractors to perform the work with all the requirements in line to be subcontractors on this project. The variance in these costs can be huge. But if the guy's got equipment nearby, as you point, point out, Mark, and there's some guys that have equipment that can do it. And it's mad. And I've seen bids as much as 100% par. So it's, a, it's really important to get a competitive bid on this. So, so I have a clarification and a question. In your schedule, you say the there's about nine months for public outreach and close to a year on providing it. I'm assuming you're doing it on a rolling basis. As soon as a request comes, you process it. You're not waiting till. I mean, it would be it would be we would prefer to spend the money as quickly as possible and get and get those funds allocated. Um, the June 30th, 2024 is a deadline in the DQ grant because if they, they're the thinking is if you don't have this money obligated, you don't have your projects lined up and or spent, we're going to give it to somebody else because the federal money is taken from them on that December uh, 31st, 2026. It's just government policy. Hopefully, you can spend that money earlier than yes. timeline you have. Yes. The second question I had was. Um, 
What's the cost for administrating this program? Does that come out of the grant money you get? It does, yes. So um, we part of an IGA um, with Washington County, and Shannon provided us with an estimate for Brian to implement the program. And um, those are considered direct costs of the mm -hmm. grant. You're allowed um, to allocate that money. So I believe it's, I think 170 is going to the grant that the county for the implementation of the grant and running the program. And then we have 830,000 going directly to. Um, about 70 percent. Is that right? And then this is a general comment. I don't know if it's uh, it's mandate that it has to go only to low income families. But do you have some maybe a separate program or within this program where you can support organizations like nonprofits or? senior citizen homes and things like that, or it has to be only individual families? It's, it, I believe it is targeted, that's a really good Zona's question. I think it is targeted at single family homes, but not that you say that, like say there was like a, a, resid, a multi-family residential that was on subject, I don't see why that would be excluded. As long as the, the, the very clear line was no public extension, okay. but I think it's still considered private, and I think that would still fit in. Yeah, for example. Oh, so I need to double check now. That's good. Yeah, uh, for example, when, when I drive on Walker Road from Canyon Road to 217, there's a small home which is actually a senior citizen, like a foster home for senior citizens. Would they, those kind of homes qualify for this? I, I think we have to follow up for sure. I think, I mean, I want to say yes, but I know the program was very fixed on residential homeowners. So if there's a company that owns that, I don't think so. Okay. So if, if that senior citizen is owned by an LC or a nonprofit or something, I don't think that situation uh, like you said that maybe something you want to follow up if it's a family run if it's a private private yeah, held sort of commercial use is what i'm hearing like, because that would that would, that would be right up into a single family home that was converted to a commercial use of a senior of some sort it, it's like a foster home see i i was in a discussion at the west slope mac last month <laughs> where the discussion came up about a home that had three bedrooms. So it was a family running like a foster home for three disabled seniors. So maybe, like you said, there may be some fine distinction between is it a commercial operation or is it a family providing service? Yeah, we'll follow up on that. And I would even actually just ask you that question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, paraphrasing a little bit here, but Brian, you mentioned um, kind of hazard properties or, or hazard sites. Um, if, how do you know that they're hazard sites? One, and then uh, if they are hazards, why would those not be the, the primary focus? Because you know, presumably they reference a lot of quality. When I was prioritizing products, those were all pretty equally weighted uh, considerations. So if it's an environmental hazard, we can multiple the effects for it or low water income, those are equally weighted in my eyes. Uh, hazards would be things that were reported to us by either the EQ or a public agency that has noted the leak, or if we can go out and see a leak or obvious failure of a septic system, then yeah, we would address those. Okay, as quickly as we possible. <laughs> in, in, when this grant is not available, how totally naive question, how are those addressed otherwise? Um, or, or are they addressed even? So our rehab program could be uh, used to address things like this um, because it does focus on life, health, and safety issues. So um, we do do water lines. We have done some big things. Uh, that being said, it's not a frequent occurrence for us, but we could utilize CDBG or City of Hillsborough or other funding sources to at least make a little bit of an impact. Those grants are smaller than this one. We could uh, 
please give it a rest. Thanks. Question about how many you anticipate the million dollar grant or the 800 and how, how many do you, and you may have covered this, um, do you anticipate being able to support or grant? My math right is, is 30. If, if each one costs $25,000, um, it's about 30. And in your GIS stuff, how many homes are identified? So I think total in our district is like seven, mm -hmm. um, women on our focus areas. I think there would be mm -hmm. So definitely a competitive program. Um, definitely TT was very focused on the grant language that you have here and, and get the money for the people who are in the uh, a couple questions on just the kind of information, I guess. What is the median family housing income now? It, it, it just changed. Uh, I released the 2023 numbers in late May. Um, I think for a family of four, and don't know this, it's somewhere around. 76,000 or below. So that's 80%, right? Yeah. So that would be 80% of the median income. So that's like the highest range of the income we would serve with this program. 76,000 is the median income, or that's the only percent? 80%. That's 80%. Okay. And like I said, don't quote me on that. I could have my numbers mixed up. It's a long table, and we could get that for you. So uh, I don't know, something in that ballpark, anyway. Is the application process just like your name and address, and it's yeah, it's a one page application? We wanted to make it as easy and as low barrier as possible. So it's name, address, phone number, email. You know, so basic contact information, some demographic questions, but. Category of the median family income you fall into, are you above eighty percent or below eighty percent? What service are you looking to have done? Will the your funds cover like the plumbing permits and the SECs and all that stuff? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, considering it's such a competitive program with thirty homes that can be granted. Um, but the timeline for accepting applications is so long. Are you considering them like if they have low income minority and uh, hazard, I guess the top three, like those would get that's the approved right away. And that's the evaluation phase as we get them. That's why we're giving a 60 day runway to allow that targeted priority audience to be able to submit them. Evaluate once that is done. If we still have monies available, that's when we'll go out to the remaining service area. One, one thing I want to make a point of here that we just talked about the total cost of 25,000, it does include SDCs, right? So, at our CFO, our SDC hook up to sources right now is. So that's your six thousand six hundred twenty five bucks to hook up the system, and then the other costs are for all those private plumbing. You know, you got to point the sewer so it goes that way instead of this way, and it starts of house. So, just mm -hmm. context. So I'm curious about the um, outreach and the kind of sixty day head start. Um, in that time, I'm guessing you're going to send out the direct mail probably right away to the homes. But how much do you know about those targeted populations and areas? And is that enough time for you to secure whatever kind of culturally specific or other assistance you may need to reach out to those areas? We're already working with organizations currently. The first wave is going to be the, the mailing outreach, and then at the same time, we're going to be working consecutively with those 
with those organizations to see what is it we can do. How could we get into the deeper dive? Um, it's not a lot of money. I mean, we've talked about this quite a bit. It's not a lot of money to distribute. So we'll see how that how that goes. But that's how we're that's how we're unveiling. Mm -hmm. Sir, did you? I was wondering, does it apply to houses that are unincorporated connected to city sewer? If there is a sewer line that runs within 300 feet of the house and the house is within the Clean Water Services Service District, yes, it would apply. Will they have to annex into the city? I don't believe so. I don't want to say no. They were asked that. I think that's it. So if that if that was to occur, it's for the lines of the city mm -hmm. right away. So they so the way the permitting is going to work, vision that the contractor would do the permitting on behalf of the I guess the homeowner would do it themselves if they if they felt confident in doing that. They would go to they would need to go to the city and ask for that protection. That's been triggered triggered by annexation process. So we want to be able to exclude that. It would be in those places. Um, <laughs> if that was going to be the case, and that you know that things more complex, oh. but I would still say there's still this opportunity to get connected when they would have the annex anyway. We're going to connect at least. So it could sway, I suppose, folks from doing that connection, but um, if it wasn't sure here. Can. Right? Yes, I a good answer. I was just concerned about them incurring further future costs after the annex. Yeah, but I would bet that that map. I would bet that the folks that are that the in the the census tracts that you laid down that you overlaid. I bet it a fair chunk of those are in unincorporated Washington <laughs> County. Yeah, there's actually. Uh, Tiger, tiger, that's what they're about. Uh -huh. Think about a loa. Yeah. The, there's, there was quite a bit in um, Forest Grove, Tiger. But then being, they have to be 300 feet from a city sewer line. So that means they're pretty close to incorporated. City of War Hours. Oh. <laughs> a public, oh, okay. You know, I was just curious, what's a practical example of this? Because, like, I live in Bethany, that's unincorporated, but we're on a sewer line. So it would be if you live in a home that has septic system. So there are, there's quite a lot of things that don't have that are sewer. But, like, in order to get connected to the sewer, that part of Bethany would have to. No, no. So this is what, what, what. Terry Brown has a really good question. It is is when you connect a sewer line, there's some if you connect to the nearest one. It's the nearest one, this is where you're right up by the but you're in an urban unincorporated. Close, close the clean water services sewer line is 50 feet away, and the beaver sewer line is 45 feet away. So you're gonna hate you're gonna connect with 45 foot typically trigger Obligation to end obligation. Let's say to Diane. So there is a UPA area that's and, and we'll explain what that is. So it's a area that the cities will be annexing into as they grow. And clean water services will do, do nothing to stymie that. So we're going to work with the city, which the property is located in the UPA area. Lots of the cities will have the customer will connect, but what they want is a waiver of remonstrance to a future annexation. That is how so or it will take coordination for maybe this big area to develop that process. So I really appreciate the question. Mm -hmm. Because we need this of annexation. Mm -hmm. So we do need to have that element um, in Joe Golf. Joe, he can help us with that uh, process, that overlay process. So we do have to identify if the property is in a UPA. Hmm. Benefit of our, our friends from Washington County. These are the type of policy things that run up with the utility. 
candidates where that is there. But that is a good, that's a good question. Many of these tend to be in unincorporated areas that are, many of them are not in the United States. Yeah. Oh. The slope. Maybe you look at the really fringy areas. Oh, thank you. Alex, I see you have your hand up there too. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, sorry, if a total project cost does exceed the 25,000, say the drain fee field is also compromised and needs to be replaced. And again, the total project will be over 25 K. Uh, will, will that deferred interest program apply to those homeowners to, uh, to, to get the job done or what happens in those cases where it's, it exceeds that price. I think we would have to look at that on a case by case basis. Uh, the requirements for. Give a loan program or the, uh, the grant program different than the ones from the Clean Water Services. So we would have to make sure that they also qualify for those programs. But uh, we're certainly no stranger to combining funds and working with project partners to accomplish larger jobs. Thank you. So just a curiosity question. Uh, previous Programs like this, have they been subscribed, oversubscribed, undersubscribed? Question. I think we have some experience with the other distribution from the project. Um, but so we have a public services example. I'm not sure, Brian. Um, and the, the, where I was leading with this was. If you are undersubscribed, do you relax the requirements and spend that money, or what happens? So it, we have a plan C. We have, you know, you always have lots of money. Um, so say we are getting up to our deadline in March, we have five months to any income category, uh, and we have eight projects coming up. Reverse interest rate. So we have people identified. That we could, that we know they would appreciate some of their um, We also have a list of have been financed um, by us, and and so it, we might want to look at their financial situation and for the program as well. So I, I don't think we have an issue. Okay. We have we have different ones, but we want to focus on the highest. We certainly know. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that idea because these funds are supposed to be spent and do some good. Just saving that or not spending that is not a good idea. So. As far as the contracts go, we do carry a wait list on most of them. I see. Yeah, so some projects that are like uh, emergency based, so no power, no sewer, no water, no. Uh, uh, if they have uh, holes in their floor that they're falling through, things like that, uh, and that's a hole that I put my hand through, we do prioritize those projects, but we do carry a wait list from year to year. Great, great, thank you. Any other questions? Great. Thank you. Thank you for Thank your you. time. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay, so let's talk about the, the West Basin Master Plan. Our commission has requested action for selection and going review of site selection list, project goals, draft selection criteria. Preparation for making a recommendation to the board of directors. Can I back up just yeah. a bit? Um, since I haven't been on the commission very long, do these programs circle back like six months later? Let us know how they're going to be. Particularly if, as Session, you want that report? Absolutely. Yeah, that would be our expectation. Rick, Rick Mike, and Andy, our West Bay semester. Good evening. Uh, we are going to talk about something that I think is very exciting because it covers not only the past, but it covers the present as well as the future. 
how we interact with our member cities, how we interact with the community, how we interact with the environment. And specifically, what we're focusing on today is going to be the West Basin Master Plan. Uh, we have some great talents uh, with Clean Water Services that are focused on this. So we have Rick Shanley, Andy Braun, Mike Itahara, and soon Josh will be working on this project as well. Uh, there's so many things I could say, but I'll just leave it at this. We are responsible for investing tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in the infrastructure to ensure that we meet the water quality objectives associated with our very complex permit, while we also have the goals of ensuring that the water quality uh, remains extremely high and that we benefit the environment. It's a complex process that requires many different levels of engagement and involvement, and we look forward to yours as part of this project. So with that, I will turn it over to the team. Thank you. Thanks, Logan. All right, so this is an overview. Uh, there are a lot of topics here, so I will not go through each and every one of these individually, but I, I do want to just say this is the first of several meetings that we'll have with you all. Um, we really look forward to engaging with this, uh, the CWAP and getting your input on the plan. We're really at the very beginning, early phases today, and uh, I'm going to give you an overview of what this West Basin plan is all about, what we're trying to accomplish with the plan itself. And really, where I hope you pay a lot of attention to everything, but there's a couple of things we really want you to pay attention to, which is the challenges ahead and the planning assumptions and goals. So we've developed a list of what we think are important. Uh, we're going to show you that list, but these are things that it, it involves the community and it involves all of, all of the folks in this in this room today. So, so those are a couple of key slides that um, we look forward to sharing with you all. Um, there is a chart, um, and I'm just going to read it, which is to review the West Basin Master Plan and provide input to staff and the Board of Directors on the planning assumptions, project goals, selection criteria, and ultimately make a recommendation on this plan. So we're going to be on a journey together to get to that point. We're starting off today with some of the initial pieces of the goals, and by the end of this thing, You'll see uh, what we've looked at for the alternatives and what we plan to do to spend all that money that we're looking talked about that we're in charge of making wise investments for. So West Basin service area, um, we have done an East Basin master plan already. So this is the second part of a two-part process. Um, the West Basin itself is a larger basin. It serves about 400,000 people. Uh, we have three water resource recovery facilities, unlike the East Basin, which only has one. Um, lots of pipe in the ground, over 1,000 feet of sewer mains, um, and then 61 miles of larger diameter pipes. We call those interceptors, so if I throw that term off, that's what that means. Those are the big pipes in the ground. And then the pump station. So this is a complicated system. Um, it's a fun system because all of these three plants are interconnected. We can send flow from one to the other. It's pretty unique to have that sort of flexibility. And so figuring out the best way to accommodate growth with all of that flexibility, is uh, it makes it ultra interesting for us uh, engineering nerds that look for this stuff. So I'll briefly go through the three plants and then uh, uh, Big, the big one is the Rock Creek facility. Um, it was constructed in 1978. It really, did I say treatment plant, Diane? Because I, these are water resource recovery facilities. <laughs> I will get in trouble. <laughs> you know, this a long time. But I'm, I will say treatment plant. So throw something at me if you want. <laughs> we have evolved. This industry has evolved. So we don't just treat wastewater. We do, we do really genuinely recover resources at this point in time. This plant in particular is one of the most advanced around. Um, it has had to be for many years to remove nutrients like phosphorus and ammonia. There's lots of other new things coming up that, that we're going to be focused on that we have to worry about above and beyond those things. But it treats about 37 million gallons of waste order a day. It's about 80% of the flow in the area. It has a large industry uh, industrial contribution. We partner with those industries. We talk to them all the time. We don't just wait for these plants to come around. But then that's a lot of what we're figuring out is how to best handle growth for both residential, commercial, but certainly industry as well. 
And then that water, uh, the resource recovery piece for Rock Creek, it's really about the crystal green fertilizer that we produce. We make biosolids that are land applied for nutrients. And we're right now embarking on the project to uh, do renewable natural gas, which we hope to partner with the Northwest Natural Equipment Pipeline. Okay, Forest Grove um, also was constructed in the, in the late 60s. It's a smaller facility. It does about 6 million gallons uh, per day of flow. Again, it's connected to Rock Creek and Hillsboro, so there's lots of fun like that. What's unique to Forest Grove is that, it, and it's not on slide, so there's a natural treatment system out there. I hope many of you have had a chance to go explore that. It's a great community amenity, but it provides outstanding treatment for metals, for nutrients as well. So whereas Rock Creek has uh, almost a bit of a water treatment plant on the end of it, this has a natural system on the end of it to, to do some of those other things that we are happy that it's there to do. And then finally, the Hillsboro facility, um, it's about 6 MGD, 7% um, of the flow. Again, it's got the interconnection. None of, none of the plants um, at Forest Grove or Hillsboro have solids treatment. So there's a pipe, that pipeline takes the solids that we generate through treating the liquid. It all goes to the Rock Creek plant um, today. And, and Hillsboro does not run at all in the summertime because it doesn't have a natural treatment system or a tertiary treatment system to meet requirements. So currently the flow from Hillsboro and it's treated there in the summertime, only when it's in the winter. But we have a lot more flow coming into the system uh, because of the rain and that infiltration and inflow, which if you don't know that term, you're going to know it really well get done with this project. So challenges ahead. Um, increasing regulatory requirements. Talked a little bit at dinner tonight about PFAS. That was just going to bring up. Uh, something that we're learning about and, and exploring, but we work very closely. We're fortunate we have a regulatory affairs department, so we're always looking at things we need to meet in the upcoming permit, copper and aluminum, or things that we're, we're faced with temperature, um, and, and beyond, 20 years and beyond, we're trying to predict what future regulatory requirements we're going to have to face. Uh, meeting the needs of our growing region, we try to do our best to see where the growth is going to happen, and he's going to talk about how we work with the different member cities to, to get a pulse on where they think the growth is going to happen, but we never want to slow down growth. Um, we want to be here to allow um, in, industrial, residential, uh, go and make, make the county and all the member cities as strong as they can be. Um, taking care of our aging infrastructure, I'm going to say it on the next slide. We are not really doing an asset management plan here. This is separate, um, but we certainly have an asset management program. Um, a lot of our stuff's getting really old, and it's a big part of our expenditure. We are focused on assets um, where we need to do an upgrade or replace. We factor in the age and their useful life, but this isn't about you know deciding which pumps to replace with the same type of pump. That's a different type of study. Uh, the other two um, are climate change. We're in the process of looking at different global and regional models to better predict that, and risk and vulnerability. Uh, I think the big one there is, of course, the Cascadia subduction zone. So if save it for questions or if you don't have any, but these are the things that, you know, we want to make sure we're capturing the goals of, of everybody, not just, um, you know, for people. Uh, but this is a pretty comprehensive list. Um, and we look forward to getting feedback on it. So storm rain stuff is entirely separate. It's not part of this. Stormwater? Or water? Yes. Good question. Um, <laughs> it does not, this plan does not include the asset piece and um, also stormwater conveyance. There's a lot going on at the district with stormwater. Uh, there was just a stormwater summit, um, but it is outside of the scope of public. So we're strictly looking at wastewater here. What are you doing with I and I? Trying to get rid of as much as we can. Yeah. There is um, seems like a stormwater connection kind of. Thing. We have lots of I and I that is. So well, some of it. Can you explain that? Yeah. Make sure that we're very clear on what I and I is. Well, sure. Right. Yeah. Well, I and I is infiltration and inflow. So we get infiltration into pipes, you know, from groundwater. We get inflow from direct connections that should they should not be there. 
And so we're looking at responses to rain events to understand is it inflow or is it infiltration? The system responds differently. And then we look at the magnitude in simple terms. When it's dry in the summer, if you've got 2 MGD of, and that's million gallons a day coming to your plant, and you have 20 million gallons a day coming in the winter, you've got a lot of infiltration and inflow. And so we, we do a lot of flow monitoring, we target areas, and we still have to decide it's expensive to get rid of it. So there's a lot of cost benefit analysis that goes into the whole INI piece. And there are a lot of policy questions that we get to talk to Diane and, and the future team about. Okay, so what is a master plan? I, I do want to say it is a living document. It used to be volumes of books you would put on a shelf. This stuff changes so quickly with, with respect to the growth assumptions, the regulatory climate. So we've set up ways to, to adapt this plan. We will update things regularly and routinely as, as changes happen, industries that might come and so forth. So we do set it up to do that, really accommodate growth. Um, and as Logan mentioned, it's a reference for planned strategic investments. So that's really what the master plan is. Um, why do a master plan? We want to do a roadmap that it's really about the watershed and improving the watershed health above all. And, and that's what the community cares about. But what it is, is this simple pyramid. We're at the bottom of the pyramid right now. So we're trying to figure out where growth is going to happen. What's going to happen? What's our crystal ball for the future? Do our best to make assumptions. If we don't do a good job at that foundation, we're not going to look at the right things. Right away. So the next step, which we're not into yet, is to evaluate the alternatives and come up with recommendations based on those assumptions. And then ultimately, it's to develop a capital improvement program. We do a pretty good job in the next five years. We'll lay out the financials over the next 20 years. We'll work with finance to figure out how to pay for that stuff. We do look at build out just so we know we're not putting something in place that might put us in a bad position in the future. So build out is, you know, the entire UGB is full. The reserves are, are there as well. And uh, so it's a lot of a space planning exercise, really. I better go quick. Um, this is too complicated to get into details, but we are in uh, phase one now, and Mike is going to talk about we had a camp that stands for concentrated, accelerated, motivated problem solving. Uh, but it was like a lockdown for a week where we tried to really understand where to sell the water because it's a complicated system. But we've got options. So it's the real big picture stuff. Where do we want to send the water between our plants? And what types of those planning assumptions? We start to make. So we'll be working um, a lot in this next phase, which is really getting into finalizing assumptions, but looking at the alternatives and developing recommendations. And then phase three is really about um, we're looking to make the next generation of these advanced planning tools. So that's uh, that's an area we want to further explore beyond what we just have today. The other part of this, as I mentioned, this is not just the group here, it's the regulatory affairs group, it's research and innovation. There's a whole team at the district that's all heavily invested in this. Okay, so outcomes of this plan, um, where and how much growth, we talked about that climate sensitivity, uh, looking at wet weather storms, uh, but also the summertime, we had a heat dome. What, what's our way to respond to that situation? How do we deal with it? flow management and, and meeting our temperature limits at the plant, seismic resilience, um, how do we repair for emergency response? How much do we invest? You could spend billions of dollars, but you have to right size your investment to, to mitigate the risk and try to get things up quickly. Um, again, regulatory and permitting. Um, and finally, the outcome is the capital. I think that's my last one. Yeah. Okay. Andy. Thanks, Rick. So my name is Andy Braun. <laughs> I'm the Systems Planning Division Manager. Uh, I've been with Spring Water Services for about 20 years. Uh, the first 17 of that with our conveyance engineering group, and then with the formation of the Regional Utility Services Department uh, a couple of years ago, I've moved over to that department. And really, a big part of my role there is 
work with our member cities in uh, planning the conveyance system. Uh, what's their role in it? What is our role in it? How do we work with them in financing and making sure that these capital improvement projects are implemented? So one of the things that Rick certainly talked about, <laughs> uh, but I want to again go back and emphasize that we're doing these master plans a little bit different format than what we used to do. We used to have a separate conveyance master plan that only looked at the conveyance system, a, a separate facilities plan that only looked at the treatment plan. The uh, last two cycles of doing these master plans, we've really integrated those and looked at both of them at the same time, really acknowledging what are the regulatory drivers that are driving capital improvement projects at the treatment plants, and how do we move that flow around? Uh, Rick described the capabilities of different plants, the ones that operate uh, only part of the year. So we've got to really look at how the system is expanding, how we get that flow uh, that's generated in one place, how do we get it to the right treatment plant that has the capabilities of treating that? So these are really integrated plans that we're working on. So I'll talk a little bit about the uh, conveyance side of this. Um, really what we're looking at is what are these conveyance upgrades that we need to support growth? Again, Rick talked about we're not focusing right now on asset management plan or replacement of the existing system as much as we're focusing on the growth area. Uh, a big part of that growth is just being uh, ready, industrial readiness. Uh, you heard at the beginning of this legislative season about Senate Bill 4 and supporting uh, the possibility of semiconductor industries uh, coming to this region. Uh, we're very actively working with the city of Hillsboro, uh, the city of North Plains, and our other partners, not only in the major semiconductor industries, but all those support industries that may come as well. Talk about the inflow and infiltration reduction. That's a big part of this. And we start talking about capacity of the system. Part of that capacity is unfortunately taken up by rainwater and groundwater that gets into the system. So eliminating that groundwater and the clean water from the sanitary system helps both from the capital improvement standpoint at the treatment plants um, and in upgrading our interceptor uh, sewers, as well as the operating cost of the treatment plant by not sending clean water to be cleaned again. Identifying the capital improvement program and associated costs, again, that's leading to the financial, uh, ultimately the financial plan. We have to know how much these costs are going to be, which all goes towards setting our, our rates. Big part of it is collaborating with our partners. As you saw the map, the majority of the service area for the West Basin isn't in unincorporated areas, it's in the cities. Uh, so this is a lot of outreach, working with those cities, understanding what their planning goals are. What are they looking at for densification of areas, for their new urban growth uh, development, and really understanding what their planners are projecting as far as uh, number of dwelling units, the industries that are coming in. Uh, so it's, it's working very closely with them as partners. And again, Rick already mentioned uh, that it's not dealing with stormwater and asset management plan. So let's talk a little bit more about those growth areas. Uh, with some of the large areas that we're that we're looking at, North Plains has a, just completing a study and bringing recommendations to their council to expand their urban growth area. If I get to the map, you'll see it's basically surrounding the city on every side. Uh, Banks uh, is bringing in a large area. Uh, if you know Banks, it's the area east of the railroad tracks where the uh, Quail Valley Golf Club is right now. Uh, there are a number of developments going on there. It's going to significantly add to flow to sanitary flows uh, that come to, from the city of Banks. Hillsboro, uh, a lot of growth there. And again, you'll see that on the map. North Hillsboro and uh, focused on industrial growth. South Hillsboro focused very heavily on residential growth. Again, the industrial areas that we talked about, uh, the long-term long -term planning, uh, looking at not only urban growth boundary, new urban growth boundary areas, but the, those urban reserve areas, the areas that Metro is looking at uh, what would be the next round of areas to bring from urban reserves into the urban growth boundary, and ultimately undesignated areas. So those are those areas that 
aren't set aside as rural reserve. And they're not necessarily set aside as urban reserve. It's going to be kind of that next look beyond the urban reserve area. Skipped over the middle housing. A very important thing that you hear about frequently is the uh, some of the legislative bills that are enabling part of densification of lots and the uh, authorization of uh, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, uh, cottage clusters. So we're very, working very closely with the cities and understanding as they're going through their planning changes where they're anticipating those that type of growth happening. It's not so much in the infill areas. It's you know it's not really going to have a big effect on the uh, sewage system, the, the conveyance system, where you take one large lot, put three houses on it in sporadic areas. But what about these urban growth areas that are set for new development that, that the planners a few years ago had been thinking a thousand homes, and now they're thinking, gee, this could be two thousand. 2,500 uh, dwelling units instead. So working very closely with the cities on what they anticipate happening with middle housing. So again, here's the, the map here, a lot of colors in here. Uh, some of the areas that we're focusing on, the uh, pink areas there, are areas that are already in the urban growth boundary and the cities are going through uh, the, the uh, community planning for those areas, preparing for development. The uh, purple areas there are areas that had been in uh, urban reserve and are currently uh, under undergoing uh, some discussion about that uh, with Senate Bill 4. Uh, some of those areas have been designated as the potential to come in if a semiconductor industry uh, decides to locate here. Uh, the area around North Plains, that could actually be kind of this combination of purple and uh, that orange color. I mentioned the, the area surrounding North Plains is coming into the urban growth boundary, but some of that area has also been set aside as part of the uh, CHIPS Act and the, the semiconductor bill. I mentioned banks, uh, the area south there, uh, south of uh, Forest Grove and Cornelius, and certainly the area in the south part of Hillsboro, all, all major growth areas that we're trying to uh, understand. So this is just a uh, slide out of uh, some advanced work that we had done that followed up on the, this first workshop or phase one that, uh, that Rick talked about where we're starting to understand the alternatives on where to send flows. Um, as we talk with the, with especially the city of Hillsborough, who does a lot of outreach to potential customers in the semiconductor industry world, the amount of flow that they talk about coming online is very high. Uh, they sometimes uh, forecast numbers of uh, opening day, they want to be able to send 5 million gallons of flow to us. That's a potential big impact on the system. We have to be ready and figure out how we're going to convey that flow and what the right treatment plan to send that, that flow is. With fairly short term in the six to 10 year range of talking about uh, expanding that, that flow up to, up to 9 million gallons. So being able to phase these improvements so that we can meet both the startup demands as well as the fairly uh, short term. And of course, understanding what they're really going to send to us. They're often uh, projecting conservatively, but we have to be pretty careful in our capital planning so that we design accordingly. We don't over design, we don't under design. So, moving on a little bit into uh, how are we going about the engagement? Um, in our scope of work with our consultants, we actually have set aside three times of outreach to each of our member cities uh, and the county representing the unincorporated areas. So we actually have the first meeting set up with them a week from this Friday. Uh, we had already done some outreach with them prior to the first workshop to understand their, their planning. But now roughly a year has passed since that time. They've been working uh, more closely with their developers and understanding the intent to utilize the metal housing. Um, so it's going back and revisiting with that, uh, those uh, growth projections with them to see what assumptions may have changed within the last year. 
Uh, so we're going to re, uh, talk with them about the results of the first workshop, the camp. And partway through uh, the next year, we're going to go and give them kind of a status report on what things are looking like, get their feedback. Are we hitting the mark for what they're uh, projecting? Do they have any questions? And then as we get to the pre-final draft, share that with them and uh, make sure that we're, that we're meeting what they are projecting as their needs as well. Um, and then certainly the, the final outcome um, is recommended. This is going to be a living document for a lot of some of these uh, resources are going to be um, electronic and technical, and, and we can change them as we go and do frequent updates. That's kind of the uh, outreach and engagement aspect of it. And I think we'll probably do questions at the end. So I'll turn it over to Mike to talk about the or the treatment plan aspects of it. Thanks, Andy. Um, my name is Mike Itahara. I'm with the Treatment Plan Services Group, and our main responsibility within the district is to develop uh, capital improvement projects, uh, treatment facilities. Uh, so we're very well invested in the master plan because that kind of develops what we're, our next five year outlook and beyond will be um, at the treatment facilities. So uh, I'll take you through the last remaining slides um, in this presentation. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what our treatment goals were. Uh, as Rick mentioned previously, what our goals for camp uh, were, and then we'll close out with schedule looking forward um, beyond uh, today's meeting. So the treatment planning focus, uh, of course, we need to maintain, as, as Logan mentioned in the opening notes, is that we have a very stringent watershed-based permit for the treatment facilities. Um, and we also have a mutual order and agreement, which gives us a little bit of flexibility during the summer months for uh, specific nutrients such as phosphorus. We're currently in that right now, but if for some reason um, that changes and we have to revert back to the more stringent requirements, we have to be prepared to do that at the treatment facility. Uh, we also, as part of this master planning effort, we want to make sure that we optimize and use the site that's available. So at Rock Creek, for instance, um, there's only so much land available at the, at the site. And so we want to be strategic in the improvements that we make and make sure that we plan for now, which is this planning period goes from now until like 2045. And then when we say build out, that would be to like 2075. So again, as Rick mentioned previously, we want to make sure that we're not boxing ourselves in the corner. Uh, we also want to address any future regulatory issues. Um, I know some are pending still, like PFAS and others, but again, we want to make sure that we have flexibility to implement uh, perhaps a cutting edge technology at our treatment facilities. Uh, we also want to adapt to population, um, industry, and permit changes. As Andy mentioned, there's lots of growth happening in North Hillsboro, but if for some reason something changes, I mean, this plan is really for projecting that growth is going to be linear, but if for some reason something happens and development stops, we also need to be able to react to that as well and re revert back to baby status quo. We also have a recycled water goal um, here at the district. This is part of our thermal management plan. Um, and so we're developing uh, additional recycled water uh, at Rock Creek, and we have plans to distribute that westerly um, in the West Basin. Some of those properties where we might use recycled water are district owned, um, and others might be uh, irrigation districts such as TBID that will work. Again, this is not a condition assessment uh, or condition assessment for existing facilities are not included in this, but as Rick mentioned previously, you know, Rock Creek and others, they were built, um, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, so again, if we come across a point where we need to expand a facility, of course, we'll take that under consideration, but we're not just looking at aged assets. Uh, so going back to the map that we saw earlier, you know, the West Basin is very complicated. There's many miles of sewer pipes in the ground. We have three, three treatment facilities, sorry, water resource recovery facilities. And uh, there are two 2024 force meetings that connect these three plants together. So it's very complicated. And um, we struggled a little bit on the onset of how we're gonna do this. And so we ended up moving towards CAP. And as Rick mentioned, it's an acronym. This is something that rural engineers have developed is really developed for fast tracking design projects, you know, things that we knew, like we need to build a new facility at the tree plant. We use this process, and the, the major advantage of it is we bring together a large group of folks 
Um, it was a five day workshop that was eight hours a day. It's pretty grueling, um, but it afforded us to reach out to many groups because this master plan touches train plan services. It touches view ops, it touches rad. And so we really needed to bring all the groups within the district together and really dig into some of these details, although albeit we try to keep it high level, but there's lots of details we need to consider. Um, so the key variables that we have listed here are, are the ones that kind of stood out to us when we entered camp. What do we need in order to develop a list of alternatives? So brainstorming alternatives, how are we gonna move flow? How much flow do we have and where are we gonna move it to? Um, so as, as Andy mentioned, we did do reach out with many of the cities and of course, North Hillsboro was the one that uh, had the most projected growth going into the future. The other cities, um, of course, they have growth as well, but they were a little bit more predictable and our assumptions um, were, were more confident in those assumptions. And uh, two particular areas uh, that, that Andy had on the previous map, uh, Jackson School West was one area that we didn't know what was gonna happen there. It's currently um, in discussions of incorporating that into the urban growth boundary and the designated use, I could believe is still kind of up in the air, right? It could be used for light industry, say like a, dinner, a data center, or it could be a heavy wet industry, chip manufacturing, another Intel firm. And so we talked with Hillsborough about timing on that, what we could project. And so we came up with some assumptions. Um, in this case, I believe it was 65% uh, would be say a light industry and 35% would be a wet industry. But that exercise was necessary because out of that, you then develop what projected flows and those would be. So how much flow do we expect from that small error? And I guess, to put it in perspective, that kind of purple area is about 1,900 acres. So it's not it's not anything to see that, right? We need to consider that. And from a from a flow number, it could be anywhere between say nine to eleven and million gallons per day, which is significant. Um, and so that was part of our initial planning, doing a sensitivity analysis and putting some bookends on what we can potentially expect uh, as we look into the future. Uh, we also talked about info and infiltration. Um, of course, as Andy was saying, we don't want to treat water again a second time if we don't have to. Uh, we have projects ongoing in Forest Grove that we're kind of using as a base case to evaluate other areas in the district. Um, so the West Basin itself is dividing into three major sewer sheds, Forest Grove, Willsboro, and Rock Creek. So again, we're going to take the information we learned from the projects we're executing in Forest Grove and apply those and figure out where the best benefit and cost ratio would be in Hillbrow and say Rock Creek. Uh, of course, MPS permit, that's a front runner for us. We need to make sure that um, we're being good stewards of the Tualto River, but also we want to make sure that we maintain, um, you know, the pride and ownership that we have our treatment facilities and some of the awards that we've gotten over the years uh, for excellent treatment. And as uh, Rick mentioned earlier, uh, biosolids is a big deal too. Uh, we primarily only treat biosolids at Rock Creek, but with emerging contaminants such as us, we have to be adaptable to uh, potential expansion where that occur. So what you're hearing is um, the beginning of a continuation of the change in mindset. Because if you think of these facilities solely as treatment facilities, you're just focusing on the technology that's needed to meet water quality standards. Now that's certainly important. But when you overlay this with a water resource recovery look, you're actually looking at ways to reuse the water, to um, augment your biosolids, to look at biogas use to create energy. And the reason for that is that creates non-rate revenue. So it's additional revenue to the utility that can be utilized that helps to hopefully one day tamper down the rates, right? Because as we invest in this technology, we don't want to create rate spikes to the customers. We want to even out our investments. And over time, by adopting this water resource recovery philosophy, we can begin implementing strategies to increase our non rate revenue. So that is why the team is chuckling, right? Because they're used to talking about these as treatment goals. But the reality is, we want to recover these resources so we can bring these to the market. And that's part of the notion of the circular economy. So it's reuse water, it's biosolids, it's the biogas that can convert to energy. 
and it is strovide recovery. And hopefully in the future, we might find other ways to recover things that could bring this value to our ratepayers. So that, that's sort of the, the dialogue. And so I saw some things I've been texting uh, Logan that of some things that we really want additional variables to be considered in the camp that is really related to this uh, resource recovery book. So thank you. Yeah. So uh, what happened in camp was again, a five day workshop and uh, there was lots of work to be done initially. But ultimately what we did was we ended up brainstorming four distinct alternatives. And the ultimate goal of camp again was to figure out how much flow and where we're gonna send it. Because out of that, then we could dive into the details of how we're actually gonna accomplish that. And so we developed four alternatives I have on the screen. I guess I'll skip to the to the uh, bar chart there. Uh, alternatives one and two ended up being the least cost alternative uh, in terms of where the flow would be sent. And in this case, that is basically maintaining status quo. Currently, the majority of the flow, if you remember from the previous slides, Creek treats 80% of the flow um, in the West Basin. And so that ended up being the least cost alternative, even moving forward, looking into the future. Um, alternatives three and four uh, were spinoffs of looking at, again, how do we leverage the other treatment water resource recovery facilities in the district? Can we, can we peel off and divert some of the flow from North Hillsborough, for instance, to the Hillsborough treatment plant? Or it can go further, which alternative four um, highlights is moving all that to um, Forest Grove. Now, each of these alternatives, what the colored bar chart means is the necessary conveyance improvements that would enable us to do that, right? So the blue bar would be gravity improvements. This could be, maybe we had capacity deficiencies already in the interceptors and trunk sweeps. Uh, the, the orange would be gravity rehab. So this could be I and I uh, concerns. Uh, there's also several pump stations that we use um, in case gravity flow does not work. So we have lift stations to lift it up. Either maybe we pump it directly to the treatment plant or we uh, leverage the conveyance network and we pump it into a gravity sewer. Uh, we also have force main improvements that would go along with that as well. Um, mainly that's discharges from, from the pump stations. And then we also have just storage improvements as well. So um, when I heard you mentioning earlier, the huge storm during the winter and your flows increase, uh, some one strategy method is to store it in the pipe network um, and kind of reduce the peak load at the treatment facilities. But in the end, uh, alternative two is the one that uh, kind of had the most benefit in terms of where we're going to send flows uh, within the West Basin. Here's a map of, again, the map that we saw earlier of the West Basin. And as I click through, you'll kind of see an overlay of where, I guess, the areas that I'm talking about. The key to the right, green is to Rock Creek, yellow is to Hillsboro, and blue is to Forest Grove. So that is the, the area that we are sending to Rock Creek. Um, so that's, you know, graphically, you can kind of see that's 80% of the flow. And then you have Hillsboro, which is the yellow. And that, I mean, for, for purposes, Hillsboro is kind of in the middle um, of the chart here. And then we have Forest Grove. The main difference between, I kind of lumped alternatives one and two together because they're very similar. But in the case of alternative two, which is still to maximize Boulder Rock Creek, the main difference is the areas identified as banks in West Forest Grove, we determined that within the conveyance system, I think it's the lower Hillsboro trunk, if we diverted those two particular areas to Forest Grove, we can avoid a significant uh, conveyance improvement project. So currently, we believe that the, the most cost-effective solution, at least at this point, to manage the flows within the West Basin is to centering the Rock Creek with banks in Forest Grove or West Forest Grove going to Forest Grove. So with that said, um, we are now gonna move into the second phase of the project. Uh, so now that we have a general idea of where we wanna move the flows and how much we're talking about and what industries might be depending that could uh, affect uh, the design outlook for say Rock Creek, um, these, these common call bubbles kind of highlight what we're, this is not everything, but these are the, the major tasks that we're looking to investigate and refine further in phase two. Uh, so in general, 
I guess I'll start here at Forest Grove. Again, going back to the Forest Grove I and I, we're gonna. There's a third phase that we might embark on uh, to see if we can reduce I and I further in Forest Grove to help reduce the amount of fuel that is being treated at Forest Grove. Uh, but again, with the results of that study, we can apply that data, um, toss or construct and implement uh, I and I reduction strategies, which would be um, pipe bursting, which basically you put a pipe in a pipe. Or um, there's also another process uh, called CIPP, which you cast a liner inside a pipe. And again, the goal there is to um, seal up all the leaky joints. Potentially, in the case of pipe bursting, you could also increase the capacity of sewer uh, main. Uh, there also is the council group pump station, which again, that there's a second study um, as part of the sub alternative to look at. Uh, you know, where the pump station go, how does it help with any uh, conveyance deficiencies to the gravity pipelines? Uh, at Forest Grove, we're going to be looking at the Forest Grove NTS natural treatment system. Uh, the natural treatment system will help us meet our permit limits for temperature, uh, nutrient removal. So, one of the regulatory things that's kind of potentially coming our way is copper, and the NTS is one strategy that we can use to maintain that. Uh, we also have reuse uh, water to TDID, again, that could be a partnership uh, with 12th and Valley. Uh, we also have the dedicated pipe and solids pipeline. Uh, it's not quite shown graphically here on this map, but there is a, you know, two force mains that connect all the treatment plants together. And the way we operate, op operate these facilities, there might be some benefit in having a dedicated solids pipeline uh, that will free up one of the force mains for reuse water. So, again, we're trying to use what we have in the ground today to the best of our ability um, and provide the best value to the district. At Hillsborough, that's probably one of the facilities that um, we're not looking to uh, expand significantly when compared to Rock Creek, but there are some preliminary upgrades that need to happen at the facility. And when I say preliminary, this is like the first part of the training process at a water resource recovery facility. This is removing rags, sticks, um, and grit. And so that facility um, will be looking to replace or upgrade uh, to handle additional flow into the future. At Rock Creek, again, since most, most of the flow is going to be sent to Rock Creek, uh, we need to look at secondary treatment expansions. Um, and I guess when we say intensify, uh, really that's a comparison to what we have today, which I guess we call it conventional treatment. Uh, but intensification would mean to um, improve on the footprint that we have, or maybe perhaps a different technology. We also have upgrades to the tertiary treatment um, also. So this is the tail end of the treatment process. Uh, we need to look at filter capacity. Um, again, we have ground intermediate filters there. Uh, we may look at alternate technologies um, to address any future regulatory issues. And then we have temperature compliance, right? So we have a thermal load um, as part of the watershed based permit. And one of the strategies is to um, is our reuse program, right? So we can divert some of that water out of the river that helps with that. Uh, we also are looking at um, some pilot projects that we're doing internally uh, to help with the thermal load in the facility itself. So this could be maybe shading uh, an open basin for solar gain, things like that. So there's some other um, aspects of the master plan that are more detailed than others, but there's there's lots of work to be done in Rock Creek. On the conveyance system, moving back up towards, um, I guess, Central Hillsboro there. Uh, again, there, there are several conveyance projects that we need to look at. I believe there were three sub alternatives that we've identified as being critical uh, decisions that we need to make. Uh, which, which are related to either gravity sewer improvements, uh, pump station improvements, um, and that could be, when I say gravity improvements, that could be a uh, replacement on the existing sewer. It could be routing another sewer or conveyance line next to it, so parallel, or it could be a combination thereof. Uh, those are things that we need to do phase two. Uh, again, as Abby mentioned, we are reaching mm -hmm. again back out to partnering cities. Make sure that some of our assumptions that we made earlier are still true, and if not, how does it affect some of the planning assumptions that we have? Uh, again, North Hillsboro is a key area that we're focusing in on. 
and with the addition of the CHIPS Act, um, we'll see how that may affect, affect some of our assumptions. Um, I think we have two more slides here. Uh, I guess in phase two, um, much like phase one, these are the planning criteria that we've developed. Some of these are carried over from the East Master Plan, uh, but I guess I'm, my intention is not to read through all of them, but these, what we would do with these is we would use these to apply, uh, we would apply them to each of the alternatives, say the conveyance terms that I just mentioned, and uh, we would rank each one of those alternatives using the criteria here um, and, and generate a composite score. What I have here on the right side of the slide is an example from the East Master East Basin Master Plan. And in it, you can see that, you know, number one, uh, it's on the, you know, the fourth bar there, which is a wet weather pump station. That was the best alternative uh, for that particular instance. I'm not sure exactly which part of the East Basin they were looking at, uh, but each one of those colored blocks uh, will feed into that. Um, and I guess just as an example, the planning criteria when we say something like operations maintenance, that could be ease of use, right? So that could be access for cleaning, that could be safety. Uh, we have routine maintenance out uh, within the conveyance system. And we wanna make that as simple as possible uh, for our field crew. So we don't wanna locate um, a conveyance system outside of the right of way where it's difficult to, to access, for instance. So uh, ease of access would rank higher, anything you know that's less ideal would rank lower as an example. I guess I'd like to, we can either pause here or maybe I get to the last slide and come back to this one, but this is definitely an area that we would like uh, CWAC to provide input on, make sure that we're covering the planning criteria that is appropriate um, for the project. And um, yes, yeah, so we can come back to this. We also have, um, as Andy mentioned previously, one of the goals of this master plan is to develop fiber outlook for CIP and possibly beyond. But it is not a necessarily a financial plan for the district. It just informs how much money we we are possibly accruing to make the improvements that we need in the next 20 years, for instance. Um, so using the capital improvement plan that we will be developing at the tail end of this phase two, we can inform uh, what our five year capital outlay would be, how much we're planning on spending. And then we can also prioritize, you know, which improvements are more important. Um, so we can you know, have a linear spending investment, uh, which will impact right, our rates. We don't want to have a balloon of rate increase. So we want to make sure those are strategic planned improvements. Uh, we also look at system development charges, right? So if we have a residential development coming up. We can look at that as well. And then anything else we can uh, we can add bond sales to that to help uh, bolster our actual outlook. Um, the last slide is just a high level view of where we're going in phase two. So the orange, if you can see from the back of the room there, we're in June, June now today. This is kind of our introduction into the West Basin Master Plan and some of the work that we've done to date. Uh, May through August is approximately, well, it's not May anymore, it's probably June, early July, through August of next year is, is the overall schedule for phase two. And that's where we're gonna do the deeper dive into the conveyance alternatives, as well as the treatment alternatives at each resource recovery facility. So the next milestone that we've highlighted is in February of next year. And that was selected as a preliminary date as we feel that by that time, we'll have a lot of these sub alternatives that are defined. We'll have them listed. We'll know it's maybe alternatives one, two, and three, um, but we'll have more detail and some sketches and concepts of what those look like. So for instance, on the conveyance side, it could be potential routing to get from North Hillsboro to Park Creek and what uh, exactly interceptor sewers, pump stations, et cetera, are part of that civil terrain. On the treatment side, we'll also have a development of um, where we need to expand facilities, uh, where, where we're kind of short and where we might expand, and the potential technologies that we're looking at uh, to best meet those needs. And then looking further into the future, August was selected as the next date for a potential CWAC meeting 
And at that point, we should have the alternatives defined. We'll have input um, from all of you on the, the sub alternatives. And uh, the hope there is then we would have, I guess, a semi completed master plan, right? We would know uh, what the preferred alternative is and a listing of the improvements within the conveyance and the treatment facilities. Uh, so during that meeting, uh, we'll review the master plan at a high level, um, almost like an executive briefing, if you will. And uh, we can then determine if the plan is ready to make a recommendation to the board. Beyond that, those dates are a little, uh, those are flexible, of course, but then we move into a board briefing. Again, we present salient findings from the master plan and any other information that we need. Uh, and then hopefully by the end of this, of the 2024 calendar year, reach a point where we can adopt a master plan and have our capital outlay defined. So that is the last slide and I'll open it up for questions. You know, Mike, what might be helpful is to maybe click back to that. Yeah, planning criteria thing, because that seem to seem to have a bunch bunch of questions on that. Oh, I think I passed it to you. Yes. So um this is more like a direction check, not a question. So when you I might have my numbers confused, but your, your alternative one and two, which is what I think you said was chosen, where Rock Creek was already passing something like 82% of the volume. And uh, you're still going with alternative one and two, where you're going to increase the flow to Rock Creek. Yes. In my mind, I think trying to expand all a critical resource already and making it a larger in terms of criticality may not be a good direction to go. For example, if you have other facilities, have you thought through if it's better to develop that capability or different capability in the other stations rather than Piling on the same thing. Things like, um, for example, in my career, we've considered things like a backup or a crossover. Backup is, well, for some reason, Rock Creek, something's broken, what do we do? Yeah. Or a crossover. You build Rock Creek, but something changed, and you need a new capability or a new. So I can't go to Rock Creek. Isn't that a criteria you should be using in trying to figure out which alternative works best. Yeah, it, it is definitely a criteria that we're still following. Uh, Audrey didn't come through that way. We do we do have, since we have the capability with those treatment plants connected, for instance, Forest Grove could serve as a backup, say if we wanted to add solid treatment at Forest Grove. Um, at this time, you know, expansion at Rock Creek was, uh, I guess, the best cost benefit, but it's certainly not on the table expand into other facilities. I understand what you're saying, right? You're putting all our eight one basket. Yeah, they, so, yeah. Right? Something like so we want to make sure that we have flexibility. But I think we're not undoing the twin twenty four force mains that we have. So we always have that available at our discretion. What is that? The, uh, those last like three words that you said. Twin twenty fours. Twin twenty fours. There are there are pipes that connect the three stream paths together. So um we're able to to manage flow Say like, uh, say Forest Grove. If we exceed peak capacity, we can send that to Rock Creek for treatment. So they're all interconnected. So I just want, I really appreciate that question because you're asking a, a very core question about resilience. And as the team begins um, thinking through this Cascadia subductions and earthquake, that's that's certainly on the top of their mind, and that the twin are twin pipes. And it is certainly a critical aspect. I also want to say. What on the fall river is really fun. So up higher in discharge to the forest grove area has even more water quality and standard requirements likely to hit us versus being able to discharge at Rock Creek or Durham. So it's really this constant sort of balance between do you just charge and bring all of those complicated industrial facilities to a facility like Rock Creek where we can handle it. 
the flows are bigger, the ability to manage the water quality requirements better at Rock Creek. But yet addressing sort of these resiliency questions. So the team is really working through that still. Because I had that, I sent a text to Logan. I go, we got a lot of eggs in our Rock Creek basket. So Rock Creek's really got to perform. But it's even taking into consideration how do we bring, we know Hillsboro works for that treatment capacity will need to be optimized, not just in this next five, 20 year window, but really the 50 year window. So when do you make investments in Hillsboro? And one of the key needs around Hillsboro is probably activating the natural treatment system that we um, first installed up at um, Forest Grove. It's really activating it out here at Jackson Bottom. So this team still has a lot of things. So I don't want you to all think that they just centered on alternative one and two yet. So I have a whole bunch of more criteria I'm actually going to add for them under the planning criteria as they assess, but they've done a great technical job assessing where flows should go, what treatment needs are, but this overlay of the future, because I do know the next permit is going to be a bit of a challenge for our facilities. Yeah, yeah, I, so we got a plan for the resiliency. So, I the, the technical and the tactical side of it, but my thought was more in terms of the strategic direction. For example, if there's a differentiation between how we treat the high tech discharge versus agricultural discharge, is that a capability I'm going to add to Rock Creek, or is there a better way to kind of distributing the strategic uh, direction rather than it's financially viable, it's tactically easy for me to use. I, I was just trying to throw a stone into the pond to see if they've thought through that, yeah. if they've been able to resolve that and say, well, we looked at it and we still think Rock Creek is the better option. Sure. That that was my intent. Yeah, that's a great yeah. question. Yes, thank you. And if I can um, just have one point on that. Uh, that was part of the camp exercise that we went through uh, to look at resiliency. One of the, the concepts, I'm sure, oh, well, there's all these boards in the way. So think about the uh, the East Basin Master Plan, which uh, incorporated the Durham facility and the infrastructure associated with it, the conveyance system, all of the pieces and parts. It's further down the system, still has a very similar more quality to that of the what you're not seeing is all of that colored area that, that shows uh, East Basin Master Plan that was done in Durham. So one of the ways I like to think about this is the march of urbanization. So when you look at where the Rock Creek Resource Recovery Facility is located that serves that green area, you can see that as the urban growth boundary continues to grow and urbanization industrialization occurs and it moves westerly, that we are positioned to expand facilities in Forest Grove as well as Hillsboro to help meet some of those needs. But we're at a we're at a really pivotal point right now because we're right on that cusp. So the question that you asked is is really one that we constantly struggle with because when do we pull that trigger? And as you saw, uh, based on what some of those alternatives are. Uh, we're talking tens of millions of dollars in difference between those decisions. So what Diane is alluding to and you are alluding to are some of those value based statements that how do we monetize those? Now, traditionally, we think about monetizing as this is a gray infrastructure project. We're thinking about it in terms of what does it cost for the concrete steel, the machinery, the equipment to put it in this place when we're tearing up roads, uh, disrupting people's lives, all of those types of elements. But what we also need to think is we start incorporating more of the resource recovery facility concepts into us and think about uh, the opportunities with reuse uh, or thermal credits. So when we start thinking about the NTS, when we think about biosolids and where we're going with constituents of emerging concern, these are all opportunities that represent that 50 year threshold. And we want to position ourselves both so that we have infrastructure that meets the needs of today but also infrastructure that will allow us the flexibility to respond to more of those societal pressures that help us make uh, value-based statements that we may not be thinking about today, but we will be thinking about in 10 years. So a prime example of this is uh, PFAS. So 
I have seen in my 30 plus year career, a number of different constituents of emerging concern kind of bubble into the general level of consciousness, but none of them really grasped the interest um, until PFAS came along and all of its other uh, components. So fortunately, as an industry, we were well positioned because we'd already been thinking about CECs in different contexts to be able to think about what would the regulatory environment be? How are the federal, how's the federal through the EPA and those different things going to view this? So we're, we're somewhat prepared. We need to take that same level of thinking and start applying it to our expansion into the further west boundary. So like we said, we're still evaluating, we're still in some of these aspects, but that is truly the key point. And because you can see how much is covered by Rock Creek and the expansion into these other areas, that now is really, uh, now's the time to ask these tough questions and spend the time to answer them. So if I understand you correctly, choice of one and two is not based only on the lowest cost. There are other. Yes. We don't necessarily want to make that decision, right? We don't want to be penny wise and sound foolish as we evaluate this, but we have to have a baseline that we start. That's why we have the four alternatives that are there that each have uh, somewhat different perspectives on how do we focus our resource mix. Uh, one of the largest ones that was distinguishing between the projects was uh, biosolids. Do we handle solids at um, forest growth? when we have additional capacity that's already sitting there at Rock Creek that uh, could be utilized for that purpose. So if we have two school buses and we're only filling each school bus with 10 students, is that a wise investment or should we have one school bus that has 20 students in it and still has room for 20 more students? It's not always monetization. No. Correct. It, it, it's, it, it, I think you, you said it as pretty much on foolish. I call it as pay now or pay later. Mm -hmm. you, pay later. you typically pay a lot more later. Yeah. 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 So I'm trying to make sure that you've gone through those discussions. You've come up with those alternatives. You're talking past tense. Let me dissuade you from that. Oh. This is, uh, this is the first presentation of many related to the West Basin master plan. Uh, the third or fourth slide in had a number of different parameters about, uh, you know, how are we thinking about this project? It's a journey that we're going to go on together. Uh, the team did a very good job talking about how they've done outreach to the cities, uh, to the county, to involve them in this process. This may be the first time this group is seeing this, but it's not going to be the last. So there's going to be different touch points where we're going to come back to you and help get some of those value-based statements in alignment. Because of course, the charge here is to make a recommendation to the board. And we wanna make certain that this is something that not just our communities, but that CWAC can help support so that we take this next journey together. Okay, so let me summarize. It's not past, but it's present continuous. Correct. Okay. okay. I'll turn back over to the team. Sorry, did my student come <laughs> Interesting, thanks. Question: This is a, you know, this is kind of a, uh, this is a large project. Geography, engineering, science, project management, Olympics. <laughs> All this, like, can, is it most of this going to be done in house, or how many consultants are going to be involved? And other disciplines. I mean, I know you guys have a like breadth of talent here, but this is a lot of stuff going on here. We have a consultant team. Uh, there's two firms that are teamed together for this master planning phase. Um, so they're key to it. But as Mike mentioned, the Trio Plant Services Group and Lance Engineering Group and Andy, we've got a lot of internal resources as well um, that will manage the projects. We do a lot of the modeling, thinking, and the challenging piece of it. And, you know, they sort of crunch the numbers. And uh, so we, we're, we're really tasked with coming up with a so the alternatives, we're covering up with the criteria, and then we're asking them to do all of the behind the scenes forward to make decisions. And then once the projects get in the CIP, those are those will be a, an assortment of consultant firms who will go through selection process um, to find the right firms, you know, to deliver the project depending on the technical nature of it. Um, 
there will be individuals in house once the decision is made to go ahead. And what will what will large services? Will you be handling the project management? Yes. Okay. Yes. You'll be overseeing the construction. I mean, one of the big elements up there that jumps out of me is construction. Yeah. Risk. Yeah. Yep. Used to just keep construction. Oh yeah. yeah. We have a construction services group, um, and then the, the design manager will stay fully involved in the construction phase to make sure that. The more unique in that, when we have a doing the design, our project managers should be in their office. So it's it's not a it's it's much more hands on than we would have ever imagined. Coming from the consultant side, been here nine years, we're really involved with the consultants, the ones that work for us, and embrace that and appreciate it. But we're the managers. If that's we're not making the drives, we're not you know we're not. Those those take many 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 people to to do the whole design package. We have to do that stuff. We're reviewing those drives, but uh, he is making the good decisions at this phase. This is where the money is. Uh, really, we bring we have uh, geotechnical firms um, that help us understand the the seismic risks at the treatment plants. Uh, and then we've we've developed some resiliency planning already. Um, so all the new stuff that we're building at treatment plants, it's it's going to be seismically useful. And we're developing other ideas and mitigation measures through this plan of how do we get those things that we know potentially will go away? How do we bypass around those? What is our how do we get water initially? We can tap it with some disinfection and then over time, we elevate the process to come to full treatment. So those are the types of strategies and investments we're going to be sorting through. Yeah, right there. Are, what are those, a lot of assumptions and a lot of uh, yeah, I guess something else. It was, yeah. um, you alluded to it before, but uh, you've been through this process with the East Basin um, uh, plan. Um, how much are you referencing that, or is that is that been helpful, or is this like start all over it's a completely different scenario we have different situations or, or uh, it, one of our charges you wanted us to look through was like those those um the planning considerations and but i mean you guys are the technical experts right like you've been and you've been through this before so is it similar to what you went through in the east basin plan or absolutely uh -huh. yeah it's not been that long, you know. Yeah. Some of the some of the reg the specifics are different. There are different regulatory challenges, but the regulatory the on the high level at this point, they are very very similar. Mm -hmm. But we're advancing, for example, climate change. Mm -hmm. You know, we have we've made assumptions in the East Basin that as that whole field is evolving and developing, we're looking to really make have better modeling and better capability. The West Basin project to understand it, and we'll go back and update the East Basin for that. So the goal is is as much as possible in uniformity and criteria. But we don't. That's by no means a sacred cow. Makes it a lot um, easier to start. Yeah. A um, couple things. The first thing I want to mention is if this is the first time we're seeing it as your advisors on the project. You might not want to give us a slide that says preferred alternative. It's, it's kind of, I'm, I'm twitching every time I see that title on that slide. Um, and I understand that you've already done a lot of work to get there. I just, anyway. But um, so I understand where the development is going to be occurring and where you anticipate most of the inflow into your system, into your conveyance system coming from. Um, what I'm struggling with is um, what is, how does this relate? Where is the nexus with the Tualatin River, with its problems, with its overallocation, with its flow issues, with its temperature issues? Um, I understand evaluation according to cost, which is pretty darn important when you're talking about this much money. I also think agriculture, fish, and wildlife need that water. 
and they need good water and they need as much as possible. How are you going to fold in what you're doing for the river into these criteria? Um, I realize tunneling all the water to Forest Grove and putting it in the river there is not a panacea, but I, I would really like to see it articulated and folded in as this process goes forward. It's really good uh, insight because really with the technical change in terms of the slippery infrastructure, so what you're asking is what's going on with the green infrastructure and the, the strength of those investments. A lot of that happens with part of the subbasin planning that we'll be doing. Although we call it stormwater, it also is really about surface water. So I really appreciate that question. I think we we'll all think about how they'll yeah. do that because it is part of integrated planning. Because what you're talking about is what is our watershed based approach? What do those projects look like? And so this team. Isn't addressing that side, but that is certainly another component. You notice engineers, I'm an engineer, so I get to <laughs> a recovering engineer. You'll notice they put limits around what they're studying. So one of it is this is not including asset management. And that is a whole other area that the district needs to work on because we are in a place right now. And in some cases, we're adding other useful lives of our district. But we need to understand where are we going to invest. And we can overlay the issues related to asset management, but you're right. If you're interested in how does this plan link with the water? Well, and yeah. then what is the reuse, the water reuse and the TBIT link? You know, is that water from treatment plants getting funneled out for use in irrigation? Yes. Or to the homes? The current plan allows for that, no matter whether you go to Forest Grove with untreated or Rock Creek, the water's gonna go that direction. That's where the big demands will be. So you can do that by using those pipelines and existing infrastructure and the treatment plant at Rock Creek creates class A, which is the highest class of water. So we have the capability to send lots of recycled water, um, 10 million gallons a day is, is what would currently be able to put through one of those pipelines. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't, I hope I'm answering your question, but water will and can go that direction. Yeah. You know, in, in my view of the water reuse strategy, I think would be really great to come to the CWAC, don't you think, Mark? Mm -hmm. Because I don't know that this group has seen that. You know, the previous CWAC group had seen a, a, what that looks like. I think we should bring it to our current CWAC. Yeah, we brought, I think uh, that came to CUAC in February of last year, of 22, so that's the number of you were not. Yeah, yeah. Um, we actually, next week, the Pacific Northwest Regional Wateries uh, Summit is here, and we're hosting here at the Water Service. So we we'll certainly bring Jared in here, so we use manager. You can see where it ties. Mike did a really nice job talking about that growth of the reuse because it's really going to grow on this side. For example, banks has asked us for the reuse strategy. So in order for that community to grow, they need to um, be able to work between potable water and regulation. So there's a lot of really great conversations. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, I, I just keep, I had a thought. It was um, basically, you know, clean water is water manager in the Tualatin Basin. You know, you're not, you're not the state water resources department, but de facto, you're the people who help shape water efficiency, the condition of the river and all of that. So I understand the boundaries, the project boundaries, and yet I also want to poke some holes and, and make sure that there is some additional feedback loops or maybe even a criteria. What does this alternative do for the river? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is there any discussion about the new CHIPS Act plans in uh, 
North Plains, Banks, you know, West Hillsboro, all that. The idea of just separating out their domestic waste from their production stuff, their production stuff into the stream systems and that kind of stuff. Most of the water, especially in the summertime, in the basin comes in from some other basin. So you would be like really adding and float all these streams. Can you get away with that by working with them on site for different retreatment conditions or requirements or the two way I'm sure I know, I, is the question is they would treat and then put it into the stream, not send it to the to our treatment. Yeah, plant. right. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a long ways for yeah. five million gallons a day from out there is a long ways. And then you've got it, it has been not looked, it has been looked at in previous plants. Um so different costs would, would have been associated with that. My understanding is there's a lot of regulatory where they would need to put that water, it'd be a real difficult time regulating to get a new permit for how it falls to do that. But what they're doing instead is they're reusing a lot of water themselves. So they're discharging less flow um, you know, than they were previously. So they are recycling that water. Uh, there were provisions way back when there were two separate pipes from the industrial campus to Rock Creek and they thought, well, we'll put industrial flow in one and domestic flow in the other. Honestly, there's not enough difference in in those stream carriages that, that that never came to to fruition. Uh, but the idea of being able to treat up there, if you could do it and get it permitted, uh, would be a good one. I think that's really challenging. from a challenge. Yeah. and then it would be completely up flow and dominate. So it's just a whole different. Um, regulatory hurdle to get over to to be able to, but you know it that thinking though helps us to really really talk about what it means to uh, bring better hydrology to our creeks because of climate change. I mean, your your thinking is straight on, Mike. That and any water is better than no water. Yeah. So, but it's really. The reason that Bob uh, is really active with the EQ and the whole concept of water reuse is so that we can begin talking about how the hydrology is changing and these streams and these wetlands need this water, this highly treated water that's very clean. So, yeah, you're, you're, you are probably in a strategy that's like 15 to 20 years, I think, out there. And, and as we begin thinking of, um, side stream treatment, lots of things, but I, I really appreciate that thinking because water, that's what this is, it's water. Yeah, and we need water. That'll be a project for Alex's helper. When I think so. A few <laughs> years from now. A little more. Yeah. I do want to do. Um, so I was just wondering with, uh, if new infrastructure does get a for that's CWS doesn't have the ability to treat that water, then do permits for building get delayed until new water services has the capacity to handle the flow, or how does that work? That's why we're doing the planning now. So we are not <laughs> in the position where we can't meet the economic needs of this region and, and the needs of the river and the watershed. So in order to enact a treatment process change, it's easily four years from the start to get through planning over something in the ground with the team to create some better strategies so we can get some planning and pre-design done so we can accelerate it because these industries want at least a two-year turnaround. They don't want four years, they want 18 months. So yeah. Logan, can you talk about that? Yes, um, it's, a, it's a great question because it gets at one of the cores that we never, ever want to be the public agency that tells economic development, no, you can't, right? That's not what we do. What we always want to do is say, yes, you can, and we want to be a willing partner to help show how we can improve the 
quality of life and provide the, the jobs and the, the industries that benefit our region. So one of the uh, areas that we are transitioning, and Diane did a beautiful job in uh, the budget message related to the operating and CIP budgets, and talking about one of the things that I noticed is previously we were thinking about just in time. So we were solely focused on that lowest cost based model and how do we deliver it. But the difficulty was I, I noticed that there were some projects where we would do two things before we would do the third thing to address it overall. Well, sometimes the amount of time that you were spending to do those two things was more than you would spend and more money overall than just doing the third thing. But you can't always do that because the drivers are different. So you've already seen how technically complex it is to just evaluate the master planning process. Now you take that similar level of thinking and you start applying it to more individual projects to serve a smaller geographic area. So there are different ways that we can think about doing infrastructure planning and especially around how we build our capital improvement plan. So uh, what we are working on now with the team is to develop strategic investments. So we've got a list of over 400 CIP projects that are there. Uh, we're going to be going through a process this year to essentially create drivers for them, understand which of those 400 projects may need strategic development so that if an industry does come in, it's pre-staged so that it is at a, a certain point of development to help speed along. So whether we say that we take a project uh, to a 30% design level, so we save the eight months or perhaps a year to get to the 30%, or we take it to the 90%, or because of the way development is occurring, we want to get the infrastructure in because it's lower cost than ripping up roads and doing all sorts of things um, later on. And this impacts how we think about industrial, commercial, and residential development and the services that are provided to those areas. So we are beginning that process to make sure, because as you see, the area is urbanizing, the industrial growth is continuing to occur. So our, our area of play is shrinking, which means our costs can increase. And what we want to do is make certain that, again, we make those investments to help reduce our overall costs so that we can continue to say yes, whether it's a residential developer, a commercial, something or other going in, or a new industrial customer. So there's no point at which Clean Water Services would say, like, we don't want development in this area. That's not our role. So the decision of land use to develop. So we are here to provide a service for service provider. We're not a land use entity. So um, that's how we think, right? So Clean Water Services is like G, right? They're there to provide a like Northwest Natural Gas. So um, that's why our coordination with the cities is imperative to us. I mean, what clean water, from my perspective, from the city's perspective, like clean water services will say, will work with us, come alongside and say, it will take us X number of months to get that infrastructure in. Um, and here's the practical reality. It's like it can't turn over tomorrow. But I, but I appreciate the role that Clean Water Services knows their role, right? Like we're not going to say you can't develop there, but here's the practical reality of when we can get sewer infrastructure to it. The other point to that is the partnership with the industries. We have to be real. Some some projects might cause an, an inordinate expense. We can do it, but we partner with the industry to say, you might be able to do this cheaper on your, if you do this certain piece here. So we 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 generally we routinely look at the whole picture. Should we take it? Would you be better off taking it? Who you know? We try not to it, just give them a number in this. We we share technical information resources to really try to figure out. What's the best solution for everybody involved? And if that's us, if that's great, but if it, if they're going to do much better themselves doing treatment, um, because it's going to be way costly for us to treat for because of the technology, they have to let them know if you did this technology, it'd save you a bunch of money. Partnership there too to try to make make these things happen. So if they say jump, what's your answer? <laughs> We jump. I mean, no. you know, 
we had a large industrial chip maker. I would say it that way. And if they're pre planning their expansion, they look at do I want to send it to clean water services or do we want to do it on the yeah, yeah. That team is very, very important. Very important things that need to be held um, confidential and then helping them work through the actual scenarios because. Sometimes industries will say they need 10 million gallons on day one, but the reality is they're starting up at one or two. And so they could actually start up while we're building them a capacity to be able to uh, meet their growth curve. So it, it takes a lot of um, coordination and, and actually it's a testament to this team because they're trusted by the industries, which is really important. It's the hang Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, Good collaboration, and in fact, sometimes we jump and they decide to make a different route. We said, you give them a number, and we say, This is a hundred million. By the way, if you thought about this, it, 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 uh, there's that we we jump because it's a fun challenge. Well, the, the right answer is, Will you jump with me? Yeah, yeah, okay. Just jump, I think. Any other questions? Nice. I was awake through the meeting. That's the Stephanie. Do we have any public members present? Not. Okay. So we don't need invitation for public comment. Okay. Well, thanks. We'll move on to announcements. Mark. Good. Thank you very much. Um, meaty topics. The next meeting is uh, the 12th of July. You know, meaty topic. Last month, our or took action. The church seed by two things. One is this one. The other one is to start looking at our climate action roadmap. So in lieu with our uh we'll come in and go through some of that. Some of the other people that have racial issues related to other climate work we're doing. We'll jump into that. Um one item I thought there was a note tonight as we talked about I of growth, we submitted a federal funding request for funding each and some of us. Now we know what I is in Forest Grove, and that's been advanced for us. So we feel really strongly about that funding. We've got five C dollars. We've got Andy Braun. He and his team really put that together, but we'll, we'll be hosting a Congress who went out on site to start looking at So excited about that. Uh, and the other thing is, I can do it again again. We're doing a canoe and barbecue. With our board of directors in September, we expect this lovely weather. <laughs> in fact, it's much later than this outside right now. So, thank you for sticking around. So, at least sometime around that September 13th is also West Flow Water District's 100th year celebration of some sort. That's also an outside activity. I'm sure some of you will get in. Uh, okay. And who's that? West Flow Water District. <laughs> Well, congratulations. It's something in part. I, I don't have the details. I think hope it doesn't clash with this, though. Should I talk to the board? Is there anybody that's on the board of West Slope? I am one of the committee. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's keeping me awake. And... <laughs> it's safe. It's safe. It's safe. Yeah. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. Sorry, God. I think we're going to be careful. It's going to come back to you. I love you.